have a really wonderful show for you today. I had the pleasure of a long conversation with Tracy Grammer, and I'll be bringing that conversation to you in just a little while. We'll also be hearing two of her performances, which she was kind enough to provide for us. So stick around, and I know you'll find her as interesting as I do. And with the lockdown that we have right now, we're forced to live in close proximity with our partner, whether it be wife, husband, whoever. And if you expect your partner to be an angel in your life, you must first create heaven at home. After all, angels don't live in hell. Speaking of hell, summer days are no fun for anyone who has worked outside near people. Wearing a face covering when is simply not fun when it's so hot and humid. And I suppose it is better than the alternative, however, so make sure you do if you go out. Due to the quarantine, I'll only be telling inside jokes. There's so many new coronavirus jokes out there, it's also a pandemic. And now's not the right time to surround yourself with positive people. Mm -mm. Not. No. And there's going to be a, a probably a minor baby boom in about nine months or so. And then one day in, say, 2033, we'll be surrounded by quarantines, for those of you who need the visual help. So much for that joke. The World Health Organization recently announced that dogs cannot contract COVID-19, and those dogs that have been held in quarantine until now can be released. So tell everyone, this is so bad it's good. Who left the dogs out? And if you run out of toilet paper, of course, you can start using old newspapers. Just remember that times are rough. I'll tell you a coronavirus joke now, but you'd have to wait two weeks to see if you got it. I'm going to go back to uh, talk about Tracy now and uh, talk about performers in general. And with the pandemic shutting down venues and festivals for so many of our performing artists, the Folk Project has been seeking ways to help them earn a living. So during the show, you're going to see a banner with ways you can donate to Tracy. Please do so if you're able. And that's more than enough of my musings, so let's get on to our friend Tracy Grammer. She was born in Florida and raised in California and now lives in western Massachusetts. I've been fortunate to have seen Tracy perform at house gatherings and small venues, and I've spoken to her a number of times before. Uh, before the shows or during breaks and things of that nature. And when I wrote to her asking for this interview, she remembered me and my wife, actually, and readily agreed. So why don't we listen to that interview now? Ready? I'm ready. Okay. First of all, thank you very much for uh, joining us today on the show. I would like to um, tell you that we miss seeing you live. And hopefully we can get back to some kind of normal stuff soon. Um, now, last August, you injured yourself pretty severely. You broke your tibia and damaged your ACL, as I recall. Mm -hmm. um, how's the healing do going right now? Well, um, you know, the healing, the ACL, when you tear your ACL, it doesn't repair itself. The tibia actually does. The little fracture that I got has repaired itself. But I'm, act I'm going in for surgery on the 23rd of July to um, to reconstruct the ACL. So, okay. yeah, I did all the PT. I've been, I'm doing what they call prehab right now, which is, you know, exercises in advance of the surgery so that I'll be stronger on the other side of it. Um, doing that pretty faithfully and trying to get just, you know, <laughs> as stable as I can, you know, in preparation for being weak for a while but we'll um, keep our fingers crossed yeah it'll be fine i actually tore the other acl 10 years ago and um the healing then um the protocol then was a lot more challenging than it is now mm -hmm. um, now we've got these you know beautiful like coolers that drip ice cold water into a brace that fits around your leg and kills all the swelling and the pain so like you know, it's gonna it's gonna suck, but <laughs> but it'll but 
it'll be it'll be less sucky than last time when I got really sick on the pain meds. So um, everyone who's a fan of yours knows that you worked, of course, with um, Dave Carter for, for quite a while. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the man behind the music? We know about his music, which was great. And the two of you were, you know, just did such a terrific job of uh, giving us some some joy. But can you tell us a little bit about Dave? Dave, you know, I, I have been thinking about Dave so much this year. You know, now that we have this pandemic, I'm I'm deep into work on my memoir, um, which is. I think about kind of about the Dave and Tracy years and then, you know, what happens after. Um, and so I've, I've been going through my journals and reading a lot of, you know, about our little experiences and <laughs> our little adventures. And he was a character, like a real character. One of the funniest people I've ever met in my life, um, full of impersonations and uh, that you might not expect. And just playful, you know, really giddy, like uh, in some ways a very silly person, you know, despite it kind of in balance, I think, to all the very serious music that he wrote. Right. You know? There are a few silly songs, you know, mm -hmm. there's a few like pretty silly, <laughs> pretty silly pieces. But um, so, you know, one thing that's standing out for me as I go through these is, is just the, um, is the humor you know, and just what a funny, funny person he was. Um, and so good with the voices, you know, like he could just impersonate. Well, he had a lot of characters. Let's just put it that way. Um, in addition to that, you know, he was, I, I've spoken at length uh, several times about the way he got his songs. You know, he, he basically mined the dream world for his songs. And so there was always an element of Dave that wasn't there. <laughs> And that was the part that he sort of, the slice of brain that he sort of saved and set aside to, to always be, you know, um, available to the muses, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was also that, you know, he was, he was there, but in my journal, I, I, often, I often said, you know, I don't feel like he hears me. I don't think he's all here. <laughs> and so <laughs> I think that, that that one foot in the dream world and one foot in the waking world, it was, you know, that was a fact that wasn't just true it was a fact that he was always working on songs and and for the most part the songs came quickly you know um he was a a runner um he liked to ride his bike around portland and running and biking are two exercises that he used to do to kind of work out song lyrics so that was actually okay. part of his writing process um, but he was really, he had a, a lot of physical activity. He was also a Tai Chi master and was, really? I think, one of the first, one of the first, you know, um, Caucasian people asked to come to China to teach Tai Chi. So um, I remember him telling me about that. And then I found a magazine or he showed me a magazine at some point where there he is, you know, he's striking a pose, but he would do Tai Chi in the hotel rooms and on the tours and stuff. And it was just such a beautiful and powerful thing to watch. Really just the grace of a dancer, but such strength too. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it, was, it was just really stunning. And then, and then some really kooky stuff like Drunken Monkey, which was one of my favorite, <laughs> my favorite uh, little, I don't know what you call it, Tai Chi moves, I guess. Um, so a Tai Chi master, a biker, a runner, a funny guy, um, vegetarian, Buddhist, most Buddhist all the time, but on any given day, he might have been a fan of, you know, Judaism or Mormonism or mm -hmm. <laughs> Catholicism. What he would pick, he would just say, you know, those Mormons, they really got it on, it got it going on. And then other times he'd say, you know, those Jews, they really, you know, I, I like that about the Jewish people. <laughs> and so I think he was sort of like a spiritual, like, buffet guy you know like he just um kind of pick and chose picked and chose what he liked out of each religion and, would that everybody do that the same thing it would be wonderful wouldn't yeah it? he just kind of folded it into his personal paradigm you know his personal spiritual paradigm and and you know at the end of the day he was just a kind person everybody who met him would say that you know how they felt seen and they felt heard and they felt mm -hmm. um 
that there was a connection. So, Sounds like he was there when people spoke to him. Yeah, most. well, especially at the shows, you know, when people are coming up and they're talking about the songs and he, he was just really interested in people, you know, like, mm -hmm. I think when, when, when a stranger came up to him, he wasn't really interested in the compliments so much, but who is this person? You know, who is this person that was drawn to my music and what is it about this person, you know, that made them, that made this resonate? He was curious about the backstory, I think. Right. Yeah. Now, I know that in addition to Dave, you worked with some other pretty fantastic uh, musicians, or at least uh, were opening act or worked with them at some point in your career. Uh, people like uh, Judy Collins and Paula Cole, among others. Mm -hmm. um, any particular thing you could tell us about working with them? How was it the first time you got a chance to work with one of these oh, really gosh. big names? Yeah, so what, Joan Baez and Judy Collins and Paula Cole and a lot, and Mary Chapin Carpenter and, mm -hmm. you know, my heroes. I got to meet a lot of my heroes and, you know, what, what I, <laughs> Judy Collins, it was so funny. Um, people, people had told me that she could be somewhat mercurial, you know, so they said, you know, you're going to open for her, but be prepared to have the very, you know, that your set length might vary. Like it might be 20 minutes, but she might decide at the last minute you're only playing 10. And so I was like, okay, I showed up at the gig ready for anything. Judy could not have been nicer. And this has been my experience actually with all like super famous people is that they're so nice. Um, and so Judy was just a sweetheart. I played the set that I was planned to play, and then she decided at the end that we should get up and sing Amazing Grace together. This was on Cape Cod. And um, I told, I had to admit, I'm such a bad folk singer. I said, I don't really know all the words to Amazing Grace if we're going to do, you know, a big version of it. And she said, don't worry, I'm one step ahead of you. I have the lyrics right here. <laughs> she waves a piece of paper. So when it's time for the encore, I come out with a piece of paper and we hold hands and we're standing on stage and, you know, she's holding her microphone with her other hand and we're singing and we're looking at the paper, but we start giggling. And then we just start messing up the song and we have the words in front of us, but we, we just lose it. And the crowd is singing and we're just like dissolving into laughter. And it was just one of the funniest, silliest moments. And then what was even more funny is that as we were walking off, she like leans in and she's like, we sound really good together. We should do this again. <laughs> and I'm like, when did we actually sing? We did sing a little bit. Um, so that was fun. And, you know, Mary Chapin Carpenter is really, um, she's one of the people that I've just listened to. And I think I've gone to more concerts by myself just to see her, um, you know, for years and years since college. And so meeting her, which was in 2003, right after Dave had died, was backstage of the um, Kate Wolf Memorial uh, Festival in Laytonville, California. Mm -hmm. and, um, and she showed up and she said that she wanted us to play Gentle Soldier of My Soul together. And I was so honored. Um, and so we go to this little kind of green area backstage and we both have our guitars and, and we're going to practice, you know, for, cause we're doing this during her main stage set. And, uh, and she starts to play it. She starts to play it and she starts to sing it. And I go, no, I'm singing it. And she's like, oh, I thought, and I'm like, no, I, I sing this one. And I'm just like, I don't know what came over me to tell Mary Chapin Carpenter what's going to happen in her set, but that's what I did. I said, I'm going to sing this one. And if, Eventually, she just said, um, okay, <laughs> and she sang harmony. Of course, she'll, she'll be the first to admit she loves to sing harmony. That's her favorite thing. So it wasn't all bad. But standing in the wings watching us while we sang was my other hero at the time and still Sean Colvin. And so it was just this, like, vortex, you know, of stars. And I was just... Um, so happy to meet them both. They couldn't have been more gracious. And uh, like I said, that's been my experience with every like, you know, monumentally famous person that I've met is they, they just couldn't be nicer and more willing to help, you know? So I've had good experiences. And who were you most excited to meet if you had to pick one person? Most excited? Well, you know, it, it, it was all different. It depended on the time, you know, when I was with Dave, of course we were 
stoked to be meeting Joan Baez. That was just like, what? <laughs> you know, for all sorts of reasons. But there was a time in 1999, um, I was at the Folk Alliance Conference in, in I think it was Albuquerque, New Mexico. And, um, and uh, I was in a showcase room doing some setup for a showcase that we were giving later that night. And someone ran up to me and said, Tracy, Frank Tedesso is here. And not a lot of people know who Frank Tedesso is, but Frank Tedesso is this master poet and songwriter out of Chicago and New York City. And Dave and I had been obsessing over his one and only record called Songs from Einstein's Violin, listening to it over and over and over because we just loved it. And finding out that Frank Tedesso was in the house. <laughs> That is the only time I ever got speechless in front of someone. Just like, I remember running to the door where Frank Tedesso was standing and I just stood there and I was like, ah! you know, I had no words. And then I ran and got Dave and said, Frank Tedesso's here. Frank Tedesso's here. He probably has no idea that we thought that, you know, we felt that way about him, but we really did. I didn't get tongue tied around Joan Baez or Mary Chapin or Sean or, or Paula Cole or any of those people. It was Frank Tedesso. And I just couldn't, I couldn't handle it. <laughs> uh, I'd like to talk about your uh, last album. Um, when, you, when you came up with Low Tide, uh, that album is, first of all, I don't think there's a bad song. For me, there's not a bad song on it. Oh, thanks. So, you know, you're very welcome. And um, the song you wrote to your dad particularly stands out and just a wonderful song. Now, when you were working on it, did you have any feeling about how it would actually end up, how well it would show? Because I thought it was received so well and what did it hit nine on the chart, on the uh, playlist? Yeah, the album was the ninth most played album for folk radio that year, it was 2018. So no, you never know. You never know if anyone's going to listen to it. You hope they do, you know. <laughs> um, a lot of us will enlist help. We'll, we'll pay a professional to make sure that all the DJs get a copy, you know, mm -hmm. and to kind of track who's playing it and see if there's anything we can do to get them to play it more often. <laughs> sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Or see if we can visit them or whatever. But I had no idea how well it would do. That album was really uh, a watershed moment for me because it was – you know, as you know, my first album of original songs, my first time stepping away from the Dave Carter material to do something on my own, right. in my own voice, with my own attitude, you know, with my own story. Um, it's been really easy for me to be a mouthpiece and a cheerleader for someone else's thing all these years. But it, it was a real um, a threshold moment uh, for me to make that re everything about it from launching the Kickstarter um, to recording the tracks to mixing the tracks to getting the artwork together everything about it was painful mm -hmm. everything about it just burned me to my core I think because um, I knew I was stepping through a really important door and it just hurt it hurt it squeezed me <laughs> like I remember just making the Kickstarter video, that little three minute plea, mm -hmm. you know, it took me three days. I was three days in front of my iPhone filming it over and over. I lost like three pounds in the process because I didn't get up to eat. I just kept trying to figure out what is it I have to say? Who am I? What am I doing? Why am I mm -hmm. asking? What do I need? How do I say it? You know? And, uh, so just everything about the album was kind of like that, you know, and, you know, Jim Henry will tell you too, because he recorded all my vocals. He was just like, Oh my God. Well, <laughs> if you consider, crazy. if you consider that, that you felt you were, you were burning up while you were doing that, you rose from the ashes like a Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't know that until I release my next album, I guess. But, um, you know, but I, yeah, it didn't kill me. So um, apparently, hopefully I'm stronger now. Um, I still am, have quite the perfectionist streak, but, but no other project is going to be like that, right? So right. This, First one's it, always a tough one. Who? yeah. I, and it, it took me by surprise. I was not expecting all of that, all of that um, to hurt so bad, but it just really hurt so bad. I think I was working through the pain of 
well, there's Dave, but mm -hmm. then also there was a recent uh, breakup of an engagement. And then there's just the idea that what if, what if I, my identity is not to tell that old story anymore, just shedding that thing that I've been wearing for, you know, 16 years at that point, it was big. It was big and it was vulnerable and, uh, you know, I'm glad, I'm glad people listen to it. I just got an email from someone who just heard whole for the first time and said, he can't stop playing. He's like, you're in my brain now. And I said, good. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled that, that people got something from it and from good life, which is, as you mentioned for my dad. So mm -hmm. What was the uh, most uh, well-received song on that album? Do you know? Well, I think it's between Whole and Good Life. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So. Both great songs, so yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> In March of 2000, Dave Carter and Tracy released an album called Tanglewood Tree. A really good album, incidentally. And on that album is a song you're about to hear. I hope you enjoy it. It's called The Mountain.
Are you writing songs now during this uh, lockdown? You know, I am. I'm writing tidbits like I always do, but I am not sitting down with my guitar to write. Um, I'm working on the memoir, so that's pretty much where all my word juice is going, you know? And uh, I'm finding bits of songs in the journals and stuff that I'm pulling out, and it's very interesting to see them um, because the tidbits, even the little artistic tidbits that don't seem to be much, you know, three or four lines, there's like, there's a world in there when you look back at it. So um, some of those I'm setting aside. I'm like, hmm, I wonder if I'll work with this. But, um, but no, I haven't, I haven't been writing songs. I'll diddle a little on the guitar and like mm -hmm. I said, take some notes, but I haven't written anything. And I feel like, you know, some, some people are really called. They really feel, you know, they need to write a song for the moment. And, and I think when I feel that call, it'll just blow right out of me, but I just haven't, I haven't felt it yet. You know, that string in me hasn't been plucked. So we'll see. Well, with all the venues that are shuttered and all the concerts, the summer concerts that were canceled, the festivals, um, how are you getting by on the, uh, on your end over there? Thanks to this yeah. little pandemic. Yeah. Well, um, part of the reason for this hairdo today is that I've been in the studio with headphones on. So, <laughs> so one thing I'm doing is recording tracks for people. <laughs> Um, so, uh, which is a, which is kind of a great development that we can do this virtually. You know, if somebody's recording a CD, they can send me their vocal and their guitar part. I can lay a violin down on top of that or a harmony vocal. Um, that's exactly what I'm doing for a guy in Montana right now. So a little bit of studio work is mm -hmm. helping. Um, I and many of my musician friends are on unemployment now for the first time. This is different you know, it's helping. It's, it's, you know, filling the gaps. Um, Jim Henry and I are giving one show a month, um, right. on YouTube. And that's been, you know, because of the social distancing, it's really not proper to do it any more often than that. Cause we don't live together. So right. we have right. to make sure that we're safe before I go into his space, you know, and he's all disinfecting and I get my own bathroom at his house and everything. It's like, um, but, uh, but we're giving shows once a month. It's kind of, it was called the Six Feet, Six Feet Apart series, but I think it might go, this next one, I think we're going to call Plan B because all the songs we're going to play start with B. So <laughs> we did that last month and it went really well. So, um, so giving the shows is helping because those, are, those generate tips and people have been extremely generous with us and, um, and that has helped us keep, you know, the roofs over our heads and food on the table. Probably at some point, you know, Jim Henry has been encouraging me to start a Patreon, which is another way um, mm -hmm. for an artist to kind of build a community of support. Um, you pay a dollar, you pay $3 a month or something, and I turn out stuff that's just for you. Um, or that you see before anybody else sees. And I like this model because one thing I found during the pandemic is that um, I really like social media less and less, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you just go on there. I call it the toilet that just doesn't flush. Like the shit just goes around and around and it never goes down. Like the same posts just keep recirculating and there's so much anger there and people are so fixed in their positions. And yeah, there's kitty videos and sometimes you'll see little interspecies joy happening, you know, dogs laying down with a cheetah or something, you know, there's little bits, there's beautiful things, some pictures, family things, but my skin is pretty thin and all of that stuff really gets to me and messes with my health and everything. And I just, can't, oh, I don't, I don't blame you. I don't yeah, blame you. I can't afford it right now. You know, I want to be happy. I want to, you know, take my precautions with the pandemic and then I want to and, you know, and I, and I show up for the marches and I do my thing, but I also, I just want to focus on my art. I don't want to get swept away. You know, I don't like that feeling of being hooked by the news of being hooked by the trauma of being hooked by this, the same bits of information going around and around. I just can't do it. So creating a Patreon, I feel like that gives me a little bubble, you know, right. it's like, here's, I, it's one thing to like have your own Facebook page, but even still, you know, people anybody can post on there. So I, I do, I do think that um, creating a bubble of support would be a healthy thing for me. And, 
you know, of course, it just it just tightens the relationship with your fans. You know, already so many of them are I'm so tight with and who support me so well. But this is just another thing we can do um, to sort of make the best of this really strange year. So, with the um, all the tension, the issues that are going on in the world, I know with uh, Black Lives Matter, with um, the political infighting that's going on and the craziness around that. Um, I know, I don't know about you, but I know I have taken a lot of notes for songs. I haven't written any, but I've <laughs> taken a lot of notes for, have you done the same thing? Do you have anything that's boiling around there too, the same way? Yeah, I, you know, I'm jotting things down, but I'm trying to figure out what is, what is my message in all this? You know, I'm not mm -hmm. an outrage artist, so you're not going to, I'm probably not going to be that person that writes the anthem, you know, that, <laughs> that everybody's going to sing in all the protests. But, you know, I have to I have to think about what do I want to speak to? You know, what, what mm -hmm. is the what's the um, how can I help is really, right. you know, more of more of where I would be headed. And I and I do I do write things down. And actually, I find that some of the older things I've written really kind of apply now as well um, with the times, almost as if I saw it coming. Like we probably, a lot of us probably did, you know, um, all this craziness. But I'm not writing anything overtly political. It sounds like you are, Joe. Um, I'm not supposed to talk about it on full project TV, but yes, I, <laughs> I, I have permission because you brought it up. I asked you. That's right. That's right. Yes, I, I've, been, I've been writing a few things that definitely have a strong message. And uh, I, it's not so much outrage as just asking why. Why are we here? Why are we? Um, and I think I sent you the lyric that I had written, um, Oh My America. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you saw there was a lot in there that talk to the things that were actually said that I wrote that before they started with the Black Lives Matter and I spoke to that and you know Native Americans and how we've treated them and you know so yeah I'm I do that <laughs> yeah no that's great now when it comes to being silly I want to get in there with the best of them so I want to ask you a silly question all right do you sing in the shower and what song do you sing I always sing in the shower, always. And it used to be my practice that I would always start with the mountain because I'm a person who, um, well, back in the day, as I'm remembering from my journals, um, I used to insist on a shower before a show, no matter mm -hmm. what. Even if I'd already had one that day, I needed another one. So, <laughs> um, and I would sing the mountain because by singing that, I would know what shape my voice was in. Okay. And I could tell if I had allergies or if it was going to be a good night or if I needed to eat something, you know, I could just tell by how it was coming out. It was kind of my litmus song, litmus test. But, um, yeah, no, I sing the mountain. And um, and then aside from that, I make up melodies. I just like to make up melodies. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Cool. Sounds yeah. like fun. I just, you know. I'll have to put a microphone in your in your shower. Really hang with me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if the COVID-19 pandemic disappeared from the planet tomorrow, just and everything went back to what, I don't know if I should say normal, because I don't think anything is normal anymore, um, and you could do anything you wanted to at all, what would be the first thing you'd do? I'd go hug somebody. You'd go what? I'd go hug someone. Hug, oh, ah. I'd probably go hug all my neighbors because they've taken, we, I live in a, it, the houses are real tight here and I live in a duplex and my landlord is next door and we're all just very connected, um, us and the two houses on either side. And uh, not only have, did they take really good care of me when I tore my ACL, one of them brought me home from the hospital, another one went grocery shopping a few times, but we've continued that, you know, during the pandemic, somebody's going to Big Y and they'll text and we'll all send in our list so that we don't all have to go. And it's been a really beautiful thing. Um, and so probably the first thing I do is go around and hug all my neighbors and thank them. It sounds like that. a plan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a plan. How is the wonderful Miss Kitty? Oh my gosh, we had a rough week with Miss Kitty. Uh-oh. Um, 
Yeah, well, she's 18 now. And on July 9th, we celebrated our 14th year together. Um, I adopted her from the shelter when she was four. But um, but she's an old kitty and she's got kidney and thyroid and high blood pressure issues and she gets dehydrated now and then. And um, uh, I guess about a week ago, she got up and she was walking really strange. Her back legs, were, um, we think she has anemia and we think it might be the kind where her body's not really going to recover from it. So um, that was really shocking. But they gave me this supplement. And I started giving it to her and she hates it, but she takes it along with everything else that she takes. And last night, for the first time in a year, she actually chased a toy across the bed. Like, I don't even know what to make of this. She hasn't even looked at a toy in the longest time, but she was tracking it and then she pounced. And I just like, I had to call my mom. I had to text the neighbors. I'm like, you guys, Miss Kitty, she's come back to life. <laughs> But, um, you know, it was just, it was a sweet moment. I noticed she's a little low res again today, but, you know, you look for these things, you don't realize like, you know, they, they age and the little behaviors start to fall away, you know, until really all they're doing is sleeping all day. And it happens so gradually that you don't really realize until something like that pops up again. And you're like, oh yeah, she used to play all the time. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was nice That's, to I see. I did an interview with uh, um, my artist friend, David Gulotta, um, in a show or two ago, and um, they just lost their cat of 17 years. And, uh, so, you know, he'd been around for a long time and is a really good cat as far as wonderful personality and everything. But we know what it's like. We certainly, um, we certainly, our heart goes out to anybody who has an ailing animal not just the yeah. one that passes, but, you know, anytime you could, it's family, their family. It's rough. Yeah. And I don't know what I would have done during this pandemic without her, because what a great distraction she is. You know, I got to make sure I give her her medicines twice a day. I got to go up and check on her a number of times a day. And she's just such good company. And then she's just tactile, you know, she's somebody to hug and love on. And, mm -hmm. you know, the pandemic, I think has been hard for people like me who live alone. You know, there's, we don't have people to process with, you know, in the day to day until you get on a Zoom call, which is so fatiguing, you know. Um, and so, you know, so there's a lot of ways that Miss Kitty has, she doesn't know it, but she's just really been there for me. She's been a, been a good, good companion. I feel really grateful. On your, um, you mentioned it earlier, your next live show with Jim. Um, what uh, date was that going to be? It's going to be July 21st. 21st. Okay, so that's actually going to be before this show airs. So yeah, the I next figured. one will be in August. Yeah, we don't know if we're doing August because I'm going in for the ACL repair. Okay. And Jim Henry's going in to have his shoulder done. Like, oh, dear. We're going in the same, like within four or five days of each other because it's like, well, if you're doing it, I'm doing it. So. We decided to just go in and then hopefully by August, late August, we can give a show, but we don't really know how we're going to be. Um, I can't remember how long it takes before I can drive again. So, cause I'm going to be locked out in a brace for a while. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'm not sure about August, but we'll see. Okay. Well, we'll we see. hope that both of you heal rather, rather quickly. We would love to have more of that wonderful music. Um, listen to the, uh, what was it, the bees? You guys were doing all the songs in the bees? Yeah, we're going to do that again on the 21st. The bee, the bees, plan B is what I call it. <laughs> that, that was fun. That was fun. So you guys did some uh, interesting selections. Uh, I uh, I was sitting there, couldn't believe it. My wife was sitting, on, well, you saw her on the couch next to me before we started this interview, and I uh, during the that point in time, I had turned around, kept saying, "Oh, they're doing this! Oh, oh, they're doing that!" You know, so I'm <laughs> excited about it. You know, um, we're probably going to wind this up in a in a few seconds, but I want to give you a chance to give a message to your fans and to the people that are listening to this interview. Do um, you have anything you'd like to say? Anything you want to share with us, and uh, let them know what you're thinking? Oh gosh, well. You know, um, I'm not trying to put you on the spot or anything. 
No, it's, I don't feel on the spot. I'm just, there's, there's a lot to say and then there's nothing to say. Like we're all kind of in the same weird boat together, you know, making the best of it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just really grateful, really grateful for the support, um, of the community. Uh, you know, when we do these little shows, this is, this is all we have to offer <laughs> in the moment. And, uh, and that people show up and they watch them and they take something from them. If they donate, great, but you know, and, and that helps us a lot, but, but even if they don't, you know, just to connect with us in that way, just to be with us in the space for that moment and, and be a part of the music that we're making. Um, it, it's a special thing. And, uh, and, you know, I'm a person who, I mean, my whole career, I've been relying on fans, you know, I just keep falling into the arms of my fans and they keep catching me <laughs> time and time and time again. It's pretty much how I started in 2002 after Dave died. I just threw myself out there and everybody caught me. So, um, you know, what can I say, but thank you. And here we are again, you know, <laughs> all of us falling, all of us catching each other, doing the best we can. But, uh, but you really can't, really can't say thank you too often. So No, and uh, I understand that uh, we can't tell you thank you too often because the joy of listening to you, um, uh, you and Jim, when you're playing together, uh, I know you played with other artists as well over the years, and everything that I've heard, I've I've enjoyed. So, thank you, oh, thank thanks. you, thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. <laughs> you have a wonderful day. Thanks so much again for being here with me. Um, sure. We will try to set up something, maybe down the road. If hopefully this doesn't last that long, but if it does, and you want to come back as a guest. We'd love to have you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. This and then we could plug Jim into showing up. Oh, he would show up. He'd be game. Yeah. <laughs> you have a wonderful day, and we'll talk soon. All right. Thanks, Joe. Take care. Thanks. Our next song was released by Tracy in 2018 on her Low Tide album. It's the most recorded requested song at her live concerts and one of my favorites. Tribute to her father who died a few years ago. Let's listen to Good Life. 20 years old, just a fitful young man with a fire in my eye. Liked a drink in my hand, kissed a pretty young girl, got a gold wedding band and a baby on the way. We didn't quite plan at all.
sick this pain in my belly it is the reckoning stick so call my daughter and we cry ourselves clear it's forgiveness and grace and i wish you were here you know yeah. last time we talked i was coming undone about a sweet peach that tastes just like the sun with the juice from that fruit tripping all down my face it's only this moment only this place and the dream surgery to repair damage to her ACL. So let's send her some prayers and good vibes for speedy and complete recovery. Incidentally, her musical partner, Jim Henry, is also undergoing a surgical procedure, so let's keep him in our thoughts as well. And that's it for today's show. I'm working to bring you more one-on-one -on -one interviews, so check back each week. I'll let you know the details as soon as I have them. As I've been saying this, as I've been I've been saying this for 11 weeks now. Please be careful if and when you venture out into the world. Wear a mask, keep your distance from others, and wash your hands often. Do me a favor. Until next week, keep peace in your heart.